Hi, good morning. My name is David Brown. I'm an immigration attorney here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Of course, what I'm going to speak to you about has nothing to do with immigration law. It has to do with me as a small business owner and my wife as a small business owner uh, and what we've done in terms of trying to continue to meet payroll obligations for the folks who work for us. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the payroll uh, protection program uh, and the economic injury disaster loan program. Uh, I'm going to try and get through those as quickly as I can. Uh, and I hope everyone's seeing the feed. Unfortunately, we had a, a small technical glitch at the beginning, so we're running just a, a few minutes late. There will be an opportunity for questions after I'm done with the presentation. And really, quite frankly, what I want to do with this presentation today is pass on as much information as I can to every small business in Lincoln uh, and anyone else who might be watching so that you understand what the program is about, uh, how you can access it, and how you can use it. And quite, quite frankly, uh, I started 2020 with kind of the wind at the back of my sails. It, you know, from a business perspective, both my business and my wife's businesses were expanding. And I'm sure many other people who are listening in felt the same way. And we didn't plan for a pandemic in our business planning model. Uh, no one really can. And so, you know, I never anticipated I would ever apply for some level of government assistance. And I think uh, if anyone has any uh, discomfort about it, uh, I think you need to get over that right now, uh, quite frankly. Um, I, I've come to terms with the program. I'm very comfortable with it. Uh, I can tell you that personally, um, both uh, for my law firm and for my wife's fitness studio. Uh, we made applications that I understand were accepted on Saturday uh, and the funding amount will be in our accounts at some point this week. Uh, so we've already gone through the program and, and so I think it's important for everyone to think about this. I, you know, big, big picture, my vision in this and when I reached out to the chamber and to the city about doing this presentation is as I was driving into my office, I saw there were so many small businesses that were closed or shuttered and unable to work. And, and so I, I saw this opportunity, let's do what we can to educate the community uh, and make sure that everyone understands this program and understands its benefit and how it might be used. So I'm gonna do that as quickly as I can in 45 minutes. I'm gonna encourage people to then access those resources and make an application. Uh, if your restaurant is closed right now, if your hair salon is closed right now, you have time today to make your application. Uh, there's a total of $349 billion that's been allocated by the federal government for this program. Uh, there's an expectation that they will add to that at the end of the day, but in their own reporting, they suggested that these funds are only gonna be available for three weeks from last Friday. Uh, I think it's gonna go quicker than that, uh, so I am interested in making sure that everyone understands uh, that they make the application. Now, there are primarily two programs that are in existence right now that help you during the COVID crisis. Uh, one is this paycheck protection program. Uh, the other is the economic injury disaster loan, uh, and that includes a $10,000 immediately payable uh, forgiven loan uh, at the front of the program. Uh, I actually initially applied for uh, the economic injury disaster loan because I thought that was the direction you were supposed to take with the application. Everything has since been updated in the system. Uh, and so the application process is a little bit different. If you're doing the Paycheck Protection Program, you're gonna apply through a bank, a direct bank, and we'll, we'll have a list of those banks available to you. Uh, you need to, when you reach out to the bank, make sure that they are an uh, SBA certified lender and that they're eligible to participate in the program. Uh, and you can access that list of banks in just a second. Uh, it, when you're applying for the EIDL, uh, you're actually applying through a portal. Uh, so you're going to fill that out electronically on your own, uh, complete it, and it's expected that you're going to get a response within 24 to 72 hours. Uh, now, a, a key thing to think about in terms of who may qualify, we're talking about small businesses. This is obviously a program through the Small Business Administration. So we're talking about businesses that have less than 500 employees. There are certain businesses that qualify with more than 500 employees, depending upon where they are and what, what their location size is. Businesses that big, quite frankly, can talk to their general counsel uh, about that. Uh, they have their own independent legal advice that can, can determine whether they qualify. Uh, I'm acting here, you know, my personal capacity as a small business owner. I want, I want to make sure you understand this. I'm, 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 not a, I'm a practicing immigration lawyer. I'm not a practicing business or banking lawyer. Uh, what I've done, obviously, is I've read the legislation. I've read the regulations. I've made my own application. And so I just want to share with you my, my understanding of it uh, and how it works. And just know that this is an evolving program. 
so even when I was given uh, what I thought was the best information, as I suggested, I made an application for the wrong program because I was told this was the program and this was the process. Found out later that it was a different process and a different program because the news was developing so quickly. Uh, and then just before I made my application, they changed the form on literally on the day of the application process. So uh, this is an evolving program. There may be changes to this after the fact, after I make this presentation. But small businesses 500 and under uh, qualify. Independent contractors qualify. Sole proprietors qualify. 501c3s, uh, 501c19s, and tribal organizations also qualify for benefits under the pay, uh, payroll protection program. Uh, I also highlighted that small businesses, sole proprietors, independent contractors, and 501c3s also qualify for the EIDL loans as well. Um, so there's, there's some overlap between the two programs. I, I'm going to talk uh, more so about the pay, payroll protection program. That's the one I'm a little more familiar with. I'm going to start with that uh, aspect of the program. Uh, the first thing you need to understand is how you uh, calculate your benefits, and I'll show part of the application in a minute. Uh, you essentially uh, go back 12 months before you apply for the loan. So technically speaking, if you're applying today, you would go, it's April 6th today, uh, you would go from April 5th of 2020 and go back uh, to April 6th of 2019, uh, look at what your payroll costs are uh, for that period, divide it by 12, and then multiply it by 2.5. Uh, in a sec, I'm going to talk a little bit about what payroll costs are, uh, so you understand what goes into that calculation. Uh, but that's how you figure out what the total loan amount is. Um, how much is forgiven at the end of the day? What they're saying is they will forgive up to 100% of that loan, and I'll walk through that calculation as well. Uh, understand again that this is capped at $349 billion, and there's a 1% interest charge. Uh, it's automatically deferred for the first six months, so you won't pay interest for the first six months, but it will accrue. Uh, so there is interest owing, and they haven't explained in the regulation that I've seen how they give up that interest. So there is an option potentially for them to forgive the interest, and they can defer it for an entire year if, if you ask for it, and they haven't talked about that mechanism yet either. Uh, but obviously from a loan perspective, a 1% loan is much, much uh, cheaper than any other loan uh, that's commercially available out there. Now. Why would I apply for this program? Uh, you know, each small business out there is going to look at this a little bit differently. I'm not going to cast any judgment on any business that's out there thinking about whether they apply for this loan. Uh, I can tell you that you might think about it from the perspective of I've got all these employees, maybe I've got 15 employees who are full-time employees, and I've had to furlough all of them. And, and what this essentially does is it will give me all of that payroll back with the exception of federal withholdings and federal taxes. And, and so if that's you know, 80 cents on the dollar, I'm not sure. It really depends on the size of your payroll. Um, and let's say you're a restaurant and you're doing a reduced service. So you're doing uh, carry out orders, you're doing deliveries, uh, those sorts of things. And so maybe your revenue on a monthly basis was $80,000 and maybe it's 25. Uh, maybe it's been cut significantly. Well, you could uh, hire all of those people back. Uh, you could hire them all back and you could pay them either 100% of their wages, 80% of their wages. You can't pay them less than 75% of their wages. That's a provision within this particular program. Uh, and let, let's say you know, there's only so much delivery and takeout you can handle. Um, you could have some people perhaps working on new menu options. You could have people working on uh, potentially you know, trying out new ingredients. And, and, and maybe you've always thought about opening a second restaurant. You could be working on the menu options for that. Maybe it's uh, looking at new equipment or some sort of an infrastructure project. Maybe it's retiling the bathroom in your restaurant, uh, having people work on, in that capacity. Uh, but the benefit of this particular program, and, and really the theory behind it is, rather than having uh, all these folks who are furloughed or laid off uh, receiving unemployment benefits, they're actually receiving their regular paycheck or close to their regular paycheck. And if you've got work that they can do that doesn't necessarily include serving a customer, uh, then you might be able to do that. Uh, and you know, when I think about my own business, geez, it's been busy the last few years. We've been in a growth spurt. There's a lot of things behind the scenes that we can do to make ourselves more efficient, more effective uh, when we get out of this downturn. So if we do have 
uh, extra capacity and we're not busy, we can work on those projects and get those things done. And there's a benefit to my business. And so for that purpose, then people can continue to be employed and continue to do work. Um, so these are the things you need to think about as an employer. Uh, but you know, when someone's getting an unemployment benefit, that benefit is ultimately capped and it only exists for a certain period of time. Uh, and if this delays someone going on to those benefits, I think it's a benefit to everyone. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there might be limitations as to when they could come into your, to your uh, area and work and how many people you would have there. Uh, but let's think about it. Let's put our, 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 our minds together and, and think about your business model and what you can do. I know behind the scenes, my wife is cleaning all the bikes. She's rented half the bikes from one of her studios. Uh, she's uh, doing other things behind the scenes with her, with her company to try and put it in a new direction. And, and so having people back to work is a benefit to you. Uh, and this program really does protect that. It, it gives you those wages for that eight week period. Um, so that's the benefit. Now, I've got a couple of links here, the www.sba.gov. That's where you're gonna actually apply for the EIDL loans. That's where you're gonna get information on the Paycheck Protection Program. And you can actually get the application form but again, you will apply through a known lender, a bank, uh, to make that application. There are, there are two other links here that I think are helpful, and I'll repeat them again at the end. Uh, there's a, a local program here through Generator, uh, and they have a walkthrough in terms of how do you apply for both programs. Uh, and then finding a bank, this link goes to a list of current banks uh, that are in the state uh, if you need assistance and you want to contact one of those banks and see if they're an SBA certified lender. Now let's uh, talk about how we calculate that loan amount. Uh, and I'll show you an application form in a minute. Uh, but essentially, like I said, you take last year's payroll and you divide it by 12 and then you multiply it by 2.5. That's your loan amount. And I, I'm guessing most people who are listening are not in the, uh, in the situation where they could get a $10 million loan. Uh, you know, if you somehow do have a, an enormous payroll uh, it's the lesser of the two times your, your one month payroll versus $10 million. So ultimately this is capped at $10 million in terms of any given loan. And I think it's important that you also understand, you know, in the situation that I'm in with my wife, she has her own business, it's 100% hers. I have my own business, it's 100% mine. Uh, we each can apply for that benefit. If I separately had two businesses, I would actually have to choose. You know, is it this business that needs the wage protection or is it this business that needs the wage protection? You're only allowed to apply once uh, for one of your businesses. So keep, keep that in mind. Uh, now payroll, and this is important. It includes wages, it includes tips, uh, it includes vacation pay, uh, it includes severance pay, it includes bonus pay. Anything that really is related to compensation for people who work for you, during that 12 month period, you're gonna put it into that bucket. Uh, you're also gonna put in uh, any sort of sick pay as well. Uh, you're, you're going to put in um, uh, any sort of 401k payments, any health insurance payments that you make as an employer. All of those go into that bucket. The things that don't go into that bucket are any federal related withholdings or tax payments on behalf of the employer. So Social Security, federal tax, uh, FICA, Medicaid, those things that get withheld from an employee's wage, they don't get added into your total when you're, when you're determining your payroll amount. Uh, once you add all those up and you come to your 12 months, you then divide it by 12, uh, multiply it by 2.5, and that's your amount. Uh, it, and it's, it, you know, it takes a few minutes, obviously, to calculate it. Hopefully, you've got QuickBooks or some other program. Uh, and then once you've got that done, you can start filling out the application and obviously make sure uh, you have that banker on your side to get this done. Now, uh, the, the one thing that I wanted to understand, obviously, if I'm going to make a loan uh, request and I'm going to take this money out, what are the repayment obligations and is this really the benefit that they're reporting? Uh, and what is the benefit to me as a business? So, you know, it's, it's all well and good to know that you may qualify for this loan, but do I really need it? Is it a benefit? Uh, is it going to help me? And I'll walk through a few scenarios in a minute. Uh, but in terms of how the, the, the calculus is done, um, at the end of the day, there's a few things you need to calculate. W one of them is you need to figure out what your payroll per person is in the last full quarter before you make the application. So that's either going to be Q4 of last year or it's going to be Q1 of this year. So if, if I'm an employer and I, I had to furlough workers or lay workers off in March, 
my last full quarter is not this full quarter of this year. My last full quarter is the last quarter of 2019. So you just need to know which one did you fully pay everyone their wages. Uh, in, in my situation, my, my last full quarter is this first full quarter of this year for my wife. She, she shut down her fitness studio on March 16th, so she's looking at Q4 uh, as her last full quarter. So that's something you need to pay attention to. Then you need to also understand your number of full-time equivalent employees during one of two periods, and you get to elect which one it is. Uh, you can either look at the period February 15th, 2019 to June 30th, 2019, or you can look at the period uh, January 1st, 2020 to February 29th, 2020. And you're going to calculate how many full-time equivalent employees you have working for you. Uh, and that's an important thing to understand because when you get into the loan forgiveness piece, you're going to have to report how many full-time equivalent employees you had during the eight-week period that you received benefits and you're gonna put that number over top of the number of full-time equivalent employees that you had during one of those two periods. So for example, uh, when I calculate mine out, I calculated out the period uh, from uh, February 15th of last year to June 30th, and there were differing amounts at different months, uh, but you average it out. And once you average it out, I reached a number of 30 full-time equivalent employees. And that included me as an employee, even though I'm an owner of the company. Uh, and so that's an easy calculus. And so if I want to get 100% loan forgiveness, I need to ensure that I still have 30 full-time equivalent employees during that eight-week period. It'll be 30 over 30, which is obviously one over one. And so that allows me to do 100% forgiveness. The other thing I want to keep in mind as well is obviously I need to pay, uh, you know, I need to use these loan uh, amounts for things that are forgivable. So I need to use it for payroll uh, and at least 75% of whatever it is you receive needs to be used for that payroll amount. And again, that includes 401k, it includes health, it includes payroll, but it does not include your federal withholdings. Uh, and then I also obviously want to uh, use the additional 25% that I'm allowed to use for things like loans, and, and this isn't paying the principal, it's paying the interest on the loan, uh, qualifying rent payments or mortgage payments, uh, and also for um, other expenses uh, such as um, utilities. And, and so that's key. And utilities, just so you're aware, includes things like phone, internet, uh, obviously water, heat, electricity, uh, anything that you would normally pay a, a normal utility service for, uh, that might be covered in there. And those are enumerated in the regulation as well. Now, one thing that we need to pay attention to is in the actual regulation it says you, you can uh, still get full uh, full-time equivalent calculus. So you know my example of 30 full-time equivalent employees uh, uh, over 30, I could uh, theoretically reduce people's salary by 25%. I can't reduce salary by more than 25%, but I could reduce salary by 25% and still hit uh, my qualifying number and count each of those people as a full-time equivalent. And, and the reason why I might do that, uh, and, and this isn't me talking about my specific business, but if I had a business and I was interested in doing this, is maybe I have significant other expenses. Maybe uh, my, my rent and my mortgage and things like that are significant expenses because whatever I do is, is, has a huge space component to it and a huge cost in that respect, and so I want to cover those expenses. It may also be that my workers are not actually working. Maybe I'm not in a position to recall my workers, and so a, a fair thing is to still give them as much as I can of that, of that paycheck, but then still attach some of that additional overage to uh, rent and utilities and those other obligations. I, I leave it up to each business to think about this and to work through the numbers. The interesting thing, though, is if you work through the numbers, they really did kind of create it so that you can put money aside with that other 25% and use that for the rent, utilities, and things like that, and it usually will cover that. Now, the one thing I want to leave you with, though, is they came out with uh, the regulations related to the application process. Those came out around 6 or 7 p.m. on Thursday, and the program started on Friday. Uh, but we don't have any regulations related to loan forgiveness. Uh, they did say that those would be coming in the, in the upcoming weeks, uh, but they, they haven't given those yet. Uh, so I think that's an important thing to pay attention to.
One thing I forgot to mention, by the way, if, if you know, uh, someone you know uh, has, has a hearing uh, disability, either is hard of hearing or is hearing impaired, uh, we will be having on the YouTube channel uh, a version for folks with that disability. So uh, if, if anyone uh, knows someone who would like to listen to this, they can absolutely uh, pay attention to this on the YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, so let's, let's actually see the form for a second. This is the header of the form. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all pieces of it, but a lot of this is, you know, for a company, biographical information, right? Name of the company, what kind of a company is it? Uh, what's the tax ID number associated with the company? Who do we contact about this? And then you see that average monthly payroll, that's the number right there. That's the, you know, if it's 150,000 divided by 12, and then you multiply it by uh, 2.5, if you have already applied for an EIDL loan and you already have that secured, you would add that in as well. Uh, and then number of employees is where you put in that full-time equivalent employee number uh, and, and add that in. Uh, and full-time equivalent obviously is the idea that if you have say, you know, two 20 hour a week employees, those two individuals working together add to one full-time equivalent. If you have, uh, you know, four 10 hour a week part-time employees, those four people together add to one full-time equivalent. You could, uh, you know, for convenience sake, go, these are the number of hours of payroll I have in a week. Uh, divide that by 40 and, and figure out what your full-time equivalent is. And maybe what you do is you take out, you know, if you've got 10 actual full-time employees, take them out, take the other people that add to your payroll uh, that are part-time, and then divide that by 40. That might be the easier calculation. Uh, but that's your number of employees that you're paying attention to. Uh, purpose of loan, uh, I, would, I would check all of these. Uh, if you're uncertain as to what may qualify that, that you could pay this on, uh, go ahead and check all of these. And other, I put loan or debt, um, so that you've at least indicated what you might be paying for. Uh, when it comes to the Paycheck Protection Program, you can't use it for accounts payable, uh, you can't use it for outside vendors, you can't use it for a variety of things, but you can use it for these things listed here, including any interest on an existing loan or debt. Uh, that, ex that existed prior to February 15th of 2020. Uh, one thing I should mention, I didn't mention at the, at the front of this, is that the business or the independent contractor or sole proprietor who's making the application needs to have been in business prior to February 15th, 2020. If it's a brand new business, you are not qualified uh, for this benefit. Uh, and each individual has 20% or more of the company needs to be listed. And there are certain requirements in terms of not being on probation or not being a felon. Uh, there are various things that could uh, make you ineligible uh, for this application. I think if you have any concern about ineligibility, you should go and look at the website and, and go through just the application itself because it will ask you just a few quick questions to determine whether or not you may uh, yourself be ineligible for the application. Now, let, let's give you a couple of examples so this is a little more tangible. Let, let's look at someone who, who's a baker, let's say, uh, and when they do the calculation and they throw everything into the payroll calculation, it's, uh, it's $250,000 a year. Uh, and that includes $65,000 a year that the owner of, of the company actually makes. Uh, and at the end of the day, they've determined that it's seven full-time equivalent employees who are working there. Uh, when, you, when you go and calculate that up, when you take 250, divide it by 12, multiply it by 2.5, you will get $52,083. Uh, and you apply for the loan and it's granted on April 8th, okay? Uh, so here's, here's where this kicks in then. Once, once the loan is granted, there's a requirement then that you only use, uh, in order to be forgiven, you use those proceeds for the various things that they're supposed to be used for. So you use it for payroll, and that includes all the elements of payroll we've talked about, and you use it for rent or mortgage interest uh, or interest on a debt uh, or utilities. And, and so you apportion it that way. Now, the baker may decide uh, that uh, because uh, a number of their staff aren't working, they may decide to reduce the hours or reduce the pay to 75%. Um, that may be something they do. Uh, and then they pay themselves the full salary because they're still working full time and doing that. Uh, that would add up to $21,346 plus $10,000 that the owner is paying. Uh, 
Uh, and quite frankly, if the owner is not operating to full capacity and, and making the regular profits that they normally would, that 10,000 may be really useful to the owner. It goes to their payroll, but at the end of the day, they're paying that down on other things they owe, maybe other accounts payable or things that they need to, to help the business survive during this period where it can't operate fully. Uh, the remainder of uh, 20737 uh, in theory, can be used for utilities, rent, loan, and interest. But the problem with that calculation uh, is that um, you actually, and I'm sorry, my, my slide updated, but it missed this update. Um, when, when you look at reducing the wages, and so look, look at the caveat here. Funds must be used for payroll or utilities, rent, loan, and interest, and no more than 25% can be used for uh, the rent, loan, interest, and utilities. And that equates to $13,000, right? So if we're using this example right now, the, bank, the, the bakers paid $31,000 in change for salaries and, and to their own salary during that eight-week period. They can only pay $13,000 in change towards utilities and those other things. Uh, so that's only about $44,000. They have a loan guarantee of $52,000, so they have $8,000 that they haven't used. Uh, and they haven't used it because they've cut uh, the wages of their employees. And so there may, be, there may be a benefit in cutting the wages. It might make sense to do that based on what's going on. And it may be that some of your employees are fully active and some of them are not. They're not in a position to, to help you out. Uh, and so that might be one of the reasons why you cut to 75% and others get 100%. But just know that you're leaving $8,000 on the table. Uh, that $8,000 could be used for your employees' wages. That's the intent behind the program. On the flip side, you as the employer are still responsible for the federal withholdings uh, and the federal taxes that you would otherwise pay. Um, and, and when I look at this uh, holistically, it really is this idea that on some level, the, the baker could be paid and made whole in terms of their salary or their remuneration. And then they ultimately really are paying that down for all the federal taxes and everything else uh, that goes there, but they get to keep all their employees and they get to keep all of their employees doing something, hopefully, uh, during this period so that when we get to the end of May or early June, we're in a position to turn the lights on and get everything moving again. And when I think about my own firm and what I've done, I, I've been building this thing. It's, it's my other baby. I've got three kids and a law firm. And, and we've continuously grown uh, over the last 14 years. And I don't want to lose my team. I've got a really good team. Uh, and the idea behind this is that I get to keep my team for eight weeks and figure out a way to move through this and figure out a way to continue to operate. And, and so this to me is, is an easy benefit to understand and an easy benefit to, to try and work through. Um, let's, let's talk about a, a more complex scenario. If, if we're dealing with a dental office, let's say, and the payroll is 750000 and that includes paying the dentist and another, the dentist owner and another dentist, and, and let's say their salaries originally were over 100000 the, the program doesn't allow an, o, uh, an owner or someone who already makes over 100000 to make more than that in this program. So reducing their salaries down to 100000 we get to a payroll of 750. Uh, let's assume it's 15 full-time employees, uh, including the healthcare costs and 401 contributions that are made by the employer. So the loan amount, if you, if you take that 750, divide it by 12, multiply it by 2.5, you get 156,250. That's for eight weeks of paycheck protection. Uh, and if it's granted on April 10th, the eighth week, uh, oh, I've got the, I'm sorry, it should be June. Sixth, I, my apologies. I'll update the slides before we share them. Uh, I'm obviously having an accounting problem, uh, but it's June 5th, uh, it, so it goes from April 10th to June 5th. Uh, the other one would have gone from April 8th to June 3rd, uh, and so that allows you eight weeks of payroll protection, uh, and so you hire back 14 full-time employees. One of them is no longer available. Uh, perhaps they went home uh, to go deal with a loved one, uh, and so they're not available. When it comes to the loan forgiveness, I, th I think you've got two options, right? If you bring back all 14 that you have available, uh, in that situation, you would have 14 full-time employees over 15, because originally you had 15 in your calculus. Uh, and so you'd only be forgiven uh, 14 out of 15 in terms of the loan forgiveness. You would give, obviously, some of that loan back uh, and repay that. Uh, the alternative, quite frankly, is you could potentially hire that 15th employee 
if there was someone who used to work for you and right now they're inactive and you'd be able to hire them back and they'd be able to do something to help you out, uh, you could actually consider hiring and you have that wage protection uh, allowed in there. Um, so that's something that you might want to consider and pay attention to uh, because it may give you a benefit during that period. Uh, in any event, you did have to um, uh, reduce uh, the salary associated with the dentist owner and the other dentist. Uh, and at the end of the day, it, when, you're, when you're basing it on a $14,000, 423 uh, per week wage obligation, uh, eight weeks gets you $115,000 of wage coverage. There's still a significant remainder, 41,000 for rent, utilities, loan interest, and, and debt. And, and if you're talking about a dental office, I know dentists have a lot of equipment and, and maybe some of it they own, some of it they lease, some of it they own, they may have interest that they're paying on that loan. That is also interest that could be uh, covered in this amount as well. So it would help you pay certain interest uh, and debt obligations as well. Uh, and in any event, the, the thing that we also need to pay attention to in terms of wage forgiveness, and I think this is a really key thing, you know, this program doesn't require you rehire everyone today. And, and I know we're, we're different here in Lincoln than, than in other places like New York, uh, where there's lockdowns and other things going on and, and where things are, are really chaotic. Uh, and, and, and that's obviously a good thing right now. Uh, you could choose to wait to rehire someone. It may not be a situation where you feel like, today I can rehire this person. Uh, I don't know if I have the loan, first of all. Uh, and obviously, once you have the loan, then you know you're in a position to do that. Uh, but you essentially, based on the legislation, you have 30 days from the date the legislation went into effect. It went into effect on March 27th, so you have until April 26th to rehire. And if you get a loan and you rehire in that period, you can then uh, still request for those wages to be forgiven in that loan but only for the period you cover. So if, if you wait two weeks to rehire after you get the loan, then you only get to cover you know, three quarters of that wage obligation uh, by hiring them back that late. Uh, so your loan is not gonna be fully forgiven and you're gonna have to pay a portion of it back. So there really is a benefit here if you, if you can get it organized and get it figured out to bringing people back right away. Uh, if, if, there's, if there's an opportunity to do that, if you bring them back right away, you'll get 100% uh, loan forgiveness on all the portions there. Uh, and so I think that's an important thing to pay attention to. Now, interestingly, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, the EIDL loans, uh, I was originally from two different sources when, you know, when the legislation came out and was signed on the 27th, I was given links by two people I know, and they said, you apply for it here. That was the information they were getting, and the information obviously was scarce, and at that time was obviously wrong. Uh, and so I went through this whole EIDL loan process and uploaded everything. What they've said since then is that anyone who applied for assistance prior to March 30th, they've thrown those applications out. That was one of my applications, right? I did everything online and did that. Um, and it, do, it just doesn't count. It's not the right forms, it's not the right process, it's not the right program uh, anymore. And, and so those, the, the application I submitted was actually for a disaster loan, uh, but they're not processing them that way. And so ultimately the loan that I got was the Paycheck Protection Program loan uh, that was submitted on Friday. Now, um, the eligibility is, is fairly similar, uh, meaning we're looking at small businesses that qualify, we're looking at sole proprietorships, independent contractors, and private nonprofits that are the 501c3. Uh, those qualify. And, and the application website I'm mentioning here, that is where the information is at. Uh, you can also access it directly through the sba.gov, and you will ultimately be going through to that link if you go to the disaster loan section. Uh, when you make your application, you are eligible for a $10,000 forgivable upfront loan. Uh, and they're saying that they'll award that within 72 hours of the application. Uh, I've not made an application for this yet because, the, again, the forms have changed. Uh, and it, it definitely does appear to be much more streamlined than the original forms I filled out. It, when I originally made the application, I had to go through and look at every single asset I hold personally, uh, including retirement assets. Uh, and report all of that information. Uh, it doesn't appear to be nearly as lengthy as that. Uh, what they are saying publicly is that it will take you about two 
uh, hours and 10 minutes to complete all the forms necessary to make an application. Now, uh, the 10,000 you can get initially uh, as an immediate injection uh, to your business. And that's ultimately premised on the idea that there was a disaster declared in the state in which you're in. For Nebraska, there's an entire statewide disaster for COVID-19. You don't need to worry about what county you're in uh, as to whether you qualify. The entire state has been declared a disaster by, by our governor. Um, so everyone technically can make the application if you qualify as a business uh, and uh, you, you otherwise qualify based on the application requirements. And so th the nice thing about it is you will literally go through the prompts and if you don't qualify, you can't get to the next screen. Uh, and so you can go through that process. Um, let me back up for half a second. I, I just want to make sure this is clear. The, the, pay pay, uh, the payroll protection program uh, was open to everyone with the exception of independent contractors on Friday, April 3rd. Independent contractors can apply as early as this Friday, April 10th. Now, uh, this program, uh, the, the EIDL, uh, with the $10,000 upfront loan, um, there's a lot of commentary that suggests this is a really good option for people who are independent contractors. Uh, you know, if, if we're talking about an eight-week bridge here, uh, and your, your normal monthly salary is around $5,000, uh, then this may be a perfect program for you. And you don't need to go through the process of going through a bank and figuring out whether or not you've got a qualified lender relationship and doing the additional calculations and, and things there. You can literally go online, fill everything out, and make the application right now. Um, so after I'm done with this, you know, your decision tree is, if I'm a business, uh, I can immediately go through the payroll protection program now. I can start filling it out and start doing my calculations. I can contact a bank. Uh, I can also consider whether I qualify for the EIDL program. If I'm an independent contractor, I can't do the payroll protection program till Friday, but I can immediately try the EIDL program right now uh, and get online and try that out. So you can either try this, this link here uh, or you can go directly to sba.gov and, and follow their links to that program. Now. Uh, yeah, so, so decision and funding within 36 hours, sorry, they said no later than 72, but they try and do it within 36 hours. And uh, the thing about the actual loan, so, so outside of this $10,000, you can actually get a, a, a loan. Uh, it's, it, the interest loan for the Payroll Protection Act is 1%. The interest expected for uh, the EIDL disaster loan is I believe 3.75% is the maximum. And it can be used for other things. So, you know, the payroll protection is for payroll. Uh, it's also for rent, utilities, and, and loan interests. Uh, this can be used for things like uh, accounts payable. Uh, it can be used for any other type of operating expense you would normally have, your marketing expenses that you might have. Uh, you can use this loan to operate your business as you normally would. Uh, and obviously at 3.75%, it's a much lower rate still, I think, than what might be available out there. Uh, and so there's a benefit in doing that. Uh, now, um, here are the links again. Uh, I just want to make sure I share them with you. Uh, I will uh, fix a couple of dates that are here. Uh, this, is, this is called the just-in-time method. You know, since all these things are changing, and at the same time I'm trying to run a business, I'm sorry I got those dates wrong in my slides. We'll fix those up before we post them. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. And again, uh, I've done my best as a small business owner to try and uh, educate myself about this. I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade, but I'm not a banking lawyer or a uh, corporate lawyer. So I'll do my best to answer questions. If you have a true uh, you know, corporate law question or, or those kinds of things, by all means, uh, I suggest you reach out to anyone you've been working with before uh, on those issues. Uh, but I do want to encourage everyone to, to look at the benefit that's here uh, and to consider it uh, and to think of it something that might benefit them. The, the final thing I'm going to say before I answer questions is, you know, as a small business owner, I think it's incumbent on us to also take care of our employees. Uh, and I've been trying to do my best to, to pay attention to the news and to pay attention to the latest in kind of health and, and welfare for our folks. We uh, went to, a, you know, a, a fairly distributed model. And this is 
uh, April 1st is quite frankly around our busiest season usually for our kind of law firm. Uh, and we sent uh, more than two-thirds of our staff home before that because we realized that there was a concern here uh, and we're going to uh, further uh, become remote employed in the very near future. At the same time, you know, everything I'm hearing is suggesting that if you wear some sort of a mask, and this is something the CDC has come out with as well, uh, if you wear some sort of a mask, your little droplets of, of uh, perspiration or, or whatever coming out of your mouth aren't going to get on anyone, aren't going to get on anything. And so, uh, you know, it's one thing for me to be sitting in my office by myself with no one else there, but if I'm going to hold the meeting, I'm now going to put a mask on. And if I'm going to go and talk to any of my staff that are still in my office, I'm going to go put a mask on. If I'm going to get closer than six feet with anyone, and ideally I don't, if I can at all avoid it, I'm going to put a mask on and I'm going to have all my employees do that as well. Uh, we really need to stop the spread of this thing and I think that's an important thing that all of us employers need to think about. Uh, there are certain things you, you know, as an employer you have to do in close quarters, but you really need to think about how you maintain safety for your folks. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, so the first question we have is from Hansa Topor. Um, she asks, I was in the process of hiring someone, my first employee, when the pandemic spread, so I put my hiring on hold. If I applied for the SBA loan and hire her, would the loan be forgiven since she wasn't an employee prior? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, I uh, was about to hire my first employee uh, before the pandemic spread. Uh, if I were to hire that person, would I have coverage essentially for their wages? And, and we go back to the kind of first principles. Uh, importantly, was the business in existence uh, prior to February 15th, 2020? That's the first thing to see if you qualify for pay tech, uh, payroll protection. And then uh, the other thing you look at, and, and in this scenario, it sounds like this is the first employee ever. Uh, you know, if you did happen to have an employee last year uh, between February 15th and, and June 30th, uh, and then now you're hiring again, uh, you might have been able to count that employee last year as a full-time equivalent and then be able to hire this person and count it against the wages that would have been paid to that person last year. The, the, the problem with the calculus though is you don't have a prior payroll for an individual uh, in this last quarter. And when you, look at, when you look at calculating up the wages, it is somewhat difficult uh, to determine that you can add them. Uh, you know, surely if, if your business uh, was earning income for you personally, uh, you still can qualify for your payroll being covered, uh, but their payroll likely would not be covered in this program, unfortunately. Uh, follow up, if I hired this person part time, would that qualify for loan forgiveness? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the follow up question is if I hire this person part time, would that qualify for loan forgiveness? And, and so the thing they say in, in the actual piece of legislation is they can't give you more than what you're entitled to. So I, I use that example of me having 30 employees and, and that was the, the, both the numerator and the denominator. I had 30 employees during that period. I have 30 employees now. If I suddenly hire five more employees, I don't get forgiven for those wages, for those additional wages I pay those five people. I only get covered for 30 out of 30. Uh, and so if you yourself were in a position where you weren't working as much and you reduced your wages so that you were only half time and this person was half time, uh, then you would have one full time equivalent and you could cover their wages, but your wages would obviously come down a bit as well in order to make that up. So I, I think conceivably there's a way to do it, but it would impact you know, how you're handling your wages uh, and taking care of that. So I, it, it's a little dicey, I'll be honest. Uh, the question from Carol Dix, do you have to have an existing relationship with an SBA approved bank to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program loan? So the question is, do you need to have an existing relationship with a lender to qualify for the Pay uh, Payroll Protection Act? You know, this is one area where I'm, I'm not as comfortable speaking to because I'm not a banker. Uh, my understanding is there's, there needs to be some sort of a relationship. Now, I'm not clear on whether there's a prior lending relationship uh, or whether it's just a situation of, geez, I've, I've got a bank account at Union Bank or Frontier Bank. Uh, I can then there, therefore talk to them and see if they'll allow me to do that. There is obviously a relationship there, and I, I'm not sure what the qualifying uh, requirement is. I know that um, you know this is one of these difficulties with the government program, right? Uh, the quickest way to give the money out is to just federalize the banks in a way and allow them to give the money out and allow them 
to process this, these checks. Uh, because otherwise, if the federal government were to try and do it, they, there's just no infrastructure to do that. Uh, at the same time, they want to try and avoid fraud. Uh, they they want to try and avoid people saying, oh yeah, I've got this business that's been up and running and, and I'll give this information and therefore I'll get this loan. Uh, and so that's why they've got this idea that it needs to be a known lender. Uh, I would contact whichever bank you normally do banking with, whether it's a personal account or a business account or, or a loan, uh, see if they're a, a, an SBA uh, certified lender, see if they will qualify you for a loan. I think that's all, before you do all the calculations and everything else, I would almost do that first and make sure that they're going to accept your loan before you do all the homework. All right, we have a couple questions here about uh, when people get the funding, if they apply for the Paycheck Protection Program loan, um, when do, at what point should they start getting money? Um, and then can you apply for both the Economic Injury Disaster Loan and the Paycheck Protection Program? So, so two questions. One is, at what point in time do you get the funding uh, from these loans? And can you apply for both loans? Uh, appear to be the common questions. Uh, the, the first question, when do you get it? Um, I, I can speak from my own experience. I, I mentioned before I had everything ready to go. I had it into the bank on Thursday night, quite frankly. The forms changed, so I had to update it all and get it back to them on Friday morning. They had continuous problems with the actual portal. Uh, and, and getting the information in and from what I've heard from talking to different bankers, you know, you've got to put a lot of data into the system, data that's not even relevant to the application uh, before you actually get the loan funded. And, and so in this situation, it took them until Saturday before they were able to get our loans in. Uh, my understanding is they expect they'll have the money today and then they can actually deposit it into our business accounts. Uh, it can be that quick, um, so that, that's very quick. On the, uh, on the online application for the EIDL, again, uh, the federal government is saying no later than 72 hours for that $10,000 upfront uh, loan, uh, hopefully within 36 hours of application. The loan itself will take longer, um, so if it's something where you're applying for, say, $300,000 for additional loan proceeds with $10,000 upfront, uh, in that situation, you get the $10,000, but it would take longer, and they've not really said how much longer for the Small Business Administration to give you the additional funds. Um, so that's the one area where I think I've got a bit of a question mark. Um, now, uh, in, in terms of, um, and I'm sorry, the second part of that was? Can you apply for both of them? Yeah, can you apply for both? The, the, the quick answer is yes. Uh, and uh, in that application form that I showed you, um, if you've already made the, the EIDL loan application and you've asked for a certain amount, let's say you've asked for you know, $200,000, um, you would add that to the amount that you're asking for uh, with the paycheck protection just so they're aware of that. Uh, my understanding is these are going to run in, in conjunction with each other. Uh, obviously, the, the EIDL is run through the Small Business Administration. Uh, I suspect, and, and this is me just uh, you know, making some, some assumptions, but my expectation then is, is that you will probably be redirected to the same bank that you used for your uh, Paycheck Protection uh, Act loan so that they can monitor both of these loans because ultimately these are handled by the private sector on the back end of this. Uh, that, that's just my assumption in it. But the short answer is yes, you can apply for both of these at the same time. And you know, my example of the baker uh, getting $52,000, that baker potentially could get the $52,000 plus the 10 uh, and, and have all of those forgiven, assuming they have enough expenses to meet the forgiveness piece. Uh, worst case scenario though, if they do a calculation and in terms of everything they spend, you know, their, their rents amounts and, and their lease amounts and their interest and things like that, aren't enough to add up to that 13,000 that they could spend, well, they would just pay that amount back plus the 1% interest and, and be done with that piece. Um, so I, I hope that answers that question. If you're an independent contractor and not allowed to work right now, how can either of these help? That, that's a good question. And so, uh, you know, the idea behind these programs, and, and sorry, the question is if I'm an independent contractor and I'm not allowed to work, how do these programs help? Uh, well, the direct answer is that these programs give you uh, the income that you otherwise would have gotten. Uh, I was talking to someone before the program about someone who uh, rents their own chair at a hair salon, and they are an independent contractor. They, they cut hair and style and do all those things on a daily basis, and you can't do that right now. 
Uh, and so the theory behind this application, and you, you, know, you might not be in a position to do any of that work right now for the next four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, uh, but if you can establish what you were making before, uh, in the 12 months before that, you're entitled to a forgivable loan during that period. Uh, and uh, you know, that, that to me is, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it, it really protects that wage that people otherwise would have received. Uh, it, it saves that person the eight weeks they otherwise may have uh, put themselves onto some sort of an unemployment uh, eligibility criteria. And, and then also if there's some issue as to whether or not they qualify for unemployment, uh, that's removed by this program because if you qualify for this program, you have eight weeks uh, where you continue to receive that benefit and then you can have that loan forgiven. So I, th I think it is a great benefit for people who are independent contractors. And again, Friday, April 10th is when the program opens for people in that situation. And you can also qualify for that $10,000 EIDL uh, loan right now online. Uh, we have a couple other questions related to eligibility. Um, one person asked um, which, which loans a self sole proprietor would qualify for, and then also uh, can self-employed people yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, which loans do sole proprietors qualify for? Uh, and what about self-employed individuals? And so sole proprietor, in, in my mind, uh, you know, it's interesting because the form itself allows you to indicate whether you're an LLC, uh, whether you have some sort of a trade name or business name. Uh, you know, a sole proprietor, in my mind, is someone who hasn't gone or necessarily registered anything. It's Dave Brown excavating. Uh, and I've not registered a business name or, or done anything and I, I use my own payroll uh, and, and, and report that on my own personal tax return. Um, that, that's how I, I guess I view a sole proprietor in this situation. Someone who's a sole proprietor may also have employees potentially uh, that they pay. Uh, and again, that's reflected in their personal tax return. Um, it, in those situations, a sole proprietor qualifies under both programs independent contractor qualifies under both programs. Again, sole proprietors can apply right now uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, whereas independent contractors uh, need to wait until later. Um, and, and, you know, it, it is interesting. I, I, I don't know that I've seen a clear definition that defines the difference between a sole proprietor and an independent contractor in these programs uh, that I can clearly understand. Uh, but, uh, you know, we think about people who might otherwise be driving a Lyft or uh, an Uber. Uh, I would, you know, most people would view those individuals as independent contractors. And again, they'd qualify under both programs. You can apply for the EIDL right now online. Uh, and you've got to wait as an independent contractor till April 10th uh, to apply for uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. I have a question from a farmer. Uh, my land rent is due in the uh, review window. Can I use the loan for this use? And if yes, would a portion of it be forgiven with the remaining balance requiring uh, repayment at 1% interest? Uh, this was a question from a farmer, and their question was, my, my uh, loan rent is due for my farm. Uh, can I use this program to pay for my rent? Uh, and the, sh the short answer is yes, uh, and uh, the, the, the more complicated answer is it, it ultimately depends on how much your rent is. So, um, you know, the interesting thing about uh, the business my wife owns is that it is space intensive, right? My, my office is much smaller than her fitness studios, uh, and so she pays a lot more rent than I do. Uh, and based on our calculation, uh, we expect with her two locations, uh, based on what her payroll numbers are, uh, she actually uh, will probably not be able to cover all of the rent uh, based on that 25% allowance for rent, utilities, and other things. Uh, I myself, though, with, with my smaller footprint, we can cover all the rent. That, there's not an issue with that. Um, so you can absolutely pay for rent. The question is whether or not, uh, when it comes to forgiveness, you have more rent due than this will cover. Uh, but it will definitely cover a certain percentage of it. Uh, and so I think you should look at that calculus. You should look to see how many folks you have in terms of employees uh, and, and what that payroll looks like uh, versus what your rent uh, requirements are. Uh, and in that Baker example, uh, you know, with $52,000 in wages uh, allowed, uh, you know, 25% of that was that 13,000 and that can go directly to rent, utilities and other loans outstanding. 
Uh, and again, that's just for the, the, the interest payment. Uh, I have a question from Carrie Jean. She said, how do you know if you need to refill out an EIDL loan? She filed on March 30th and wasn't sure if she was accepted or not. So I, I, the, the question is, um, I filled out an EIDL loan on March 30th. Uh, and how do I know whether or not uh, I need to redo it? Um, the date, I, I, it's either on or before the 30th uh, or after the 30th. Now, um, I think what you can do, quite frankly, is go to the sba.gov website and, and look to see what the application process is. If you did the online version where you fill out a questionnaire online and move to the next step and move to the next step versus filling out paper forms or PDFs, uh, that you upload into the system. Uh, if you did that old paper upload thing, that's not the system anymore. Uh, and whatever you filled out is not being processed uh, and you need to fill out a new one. I think that's probably the easier answer. So I filled out the old paper one, uploaded it to the system, got a note saying it was uploaded. That's not the program anymore. Uh, and you've got to go through uh, a number of pages where you fill in the information. And this particular one, the generator, one has a link as well where they walk you through all of those pages and you'll be able to see right away. Uh, and they even have slides where they show the old system that people applied under to show you that that's the old thing and it doesn't apply anymore. So hopefully that helps. Uh, I think maybe it would be helpful if you could just go over one, once again real quickly the eligible uses for the PPP loan and for the EIDL loan, what people can use that. So uh, just talking about the pay, so the question was, what are the eligible uses for these programs? Uh, what can you use them on? And so the calculation that you're looking at for the payroll protection program uh, relates to any type of wages, tips, uh, vacation pay, uh, sick pay, and understand there, there's, oh, you know, us lawyers love this, there's always an exemption to everything. Uh, you know, if during the course of this eight week period, someone gets sick with COVID and it falls under one of the other bills that was passed in recent weeks where someone has their uh, health insurance and everything covered because of COVID and as an employer, you get a, um, basically a write down on those costs. Uh, you can't use those wages towards uh, forgiveness in this loan. Those come out of a different program. But in any event, when you're calculating it, you look at wages, tips, sick pay, um, uh, vacation pay, severance pay, uh, everything that goes into your wage obligation, commissions, bonuses, all of those things. Uh, you, you don't include federal taxes or withholdings. Uh, you don't include those, but you include any health insurance costs, any 401k benefits. So the easiest way to think about it is take your total payroll and just take out the federal pieces of it. Uh, and then that gives you a number. Then look at how much if you're a big enough employer that you have health insurance that you pay for as an employer, put that in. If you put into an HSA, put that in. If you uh, do matching for 401k, put that in. That gets you to your total payroll cost. Uh, that's your first part of the calculation. Now, uh, then you worry about what can be forgiven. Uh, and it's only things that are eligible to be paid on. So those same things we talked about, those amounts can be forgiven. Uh, if you pay for those things. And those amounts are supposed to equal at least 75% of the loan forgiveness. The remaining 25% uh, can be things for, again, rent, uh, utilities, and utilities include telephone, internet, uh, water, heat, uh, electricity, and um, I think that's it. Um, and then uh, any type of an outstanding loan obligation as well. Uh, so if, you know, you, in, in the case of my wife's fitness studio, she bought fitness equipment. Uh, there's a loan outstanding on that. So you can't pay the principal, but you can pay the interest components of that loan uh, as long as that loan was in existence prior to February 15th, 2020. Um, so that's what you can do with uh, the, uh, with the pay Payroll Protection Act. With the EIDL, uh, you can pay for all of those things plus more. Uh, but the only forgiveness amount that goes into any of this is that upfront $10,000 award uh, that they give you at the front of it. Everything else is treated as a loan, is expected to be repaid. Uh, you provide guarantees on that money. 
Uh, there's that expectation, uh, and it's at a 3.75% interest rate, whereas the payroll protection program is at a 1% interest rate. So hopefully that helps you understand the two. Um, so if, you know, there might be a benefit to both applications, there might be a benefit to just one. Uh, I, I think you need to weigh the pros and cons. And, and again, I, I know there are, are people out there looking at these programs and depending upon what your loss is, you really can only, you know, cover that loss once. Uh, and, and so uh, it might make more sense to do the EIDL if you're an independent contractor. That's what some people have been suggesting. And if you do have your own, you know, accountant or, or business person that you rely on regularly, it, it, it might not hurt to talk to them about it after running the calculations and see what they think about these programs. Uh, quick follow-up on that. Um, you mentioned people can uh, use it for rent and utilities um, on the Paycheck Protection Program loan, or at least a portion for rent and utilities. Can they also use it for mortgages? A follow-up question for rent and utilities, can it also be used for mortgages? And yes, I, you know, I, I'm a little biased. I pay rent. I don't own the facilities that we work in. Uh, but absolutely, if you have a mortgage obligation due, uh, you can use that to pay the mortgage. Uh, so if you own your own building you're operating in, uh, you can use these funds to pay the mortgage. Uh, and again, it's, uh, it's on interest on the mortgage. Uh, it's not on principle on the mortgage, uh, similar to, uh, to any other debt uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, quick question on nonprofits. Um, can, which nonprofits qualify for the PPP and for the EIDL? So the question is on nonprofits, which nonprofits can qualify? Uh, for the PPP and the EIDL. It's my understanding that, uh, and, and from what I've seen, it's the 501c3s uh, that qualify for both uh, of these benefits. Uh, I've not seen anything else. I, I know I've seen uh, in, in various types of work I do, a 501c4 or a 501c6, but those, those I've not seen mentioned in these programs. I, I, I'm, uh, I'll be honest with you, the 501c19 uh, is mentioned uh, as qualifying, um, and I'm trying. Uh, that's a veteran affairs organization. Uh, is the 501c19 um, that qualifies under the Payroll Protection Act? It is not listed in the EIDL, um, so uh, that's that's something to pay attention to. And the the thing that I will say is nice about these programs is that when you actually go through the application process, it asks you these questions to determine whether you qualify or not. Uh, and so you will rule yourself out if, you know, if I was not, a, if I was a 501c4, let's say, um, I would realize pretty quickly I don't qualify for the benefit as I work through the application. Uh, I guess final question. Um, I bought a home business last year, but since I've been trying to grow it, I haven't been paying myself. Um, can you please explain how that would, the PPP loan would apply to me? So this person uh, is saying they have a home business uh, that they started last year, but they haven't been paying themselves. Uh, how would the PPP apply to them? Uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, the, the thing that they talk about in the regulation when they talk about uh, you know, payroll, uh, as they talk about wages, commissions, bonuses, and such other things. Uh, I guess the question I would ask uh, is, is that business profitable? Um, did this business make money in the last 12 months? Uh, and therefore, that is money that would be entitled to the owner. Uh, if, if I was the owner of a business and I made $60,000 last year, and that's what I was going to report on my income tax, even though I didn't pay myself on a weekly basis, those wages, if I've got you know, the receipts and everything to show that I made that money, uh, then, and, and again, we've got to look at that period, that 12 month period uh, prior to the application for the loan. So it's not a calendar year. It's you know, essentially the first three months or so of this year and the last nine months of last year. Uh, but if I could document that in my home business, I made $65,000 in that 12 month period, uh, then I would apply based on a $65,000 uh, income. Uh, and when you make your application to your known lender, uh, you do need to provide backup. We had pay, uh, QuickBooks schedules that we included uh, for both of our applications to list all the people who are on payroll, to list how much they were paid. 
uh, to list what various other expenses are involved in the calculation. Uh, and then I certified that that's true and correct. Uh, so if you've got the records and you can document that, uh, then I would make the application. Now, of course, on the flip side, if this is a brand new business and you've, you've put all of this time and energy into it and you've not made the money back yet, I think that's a little bit more of a difficult situation. It's hard to argue that uh, there's some sort of income or some sort of benefit that you've derived from it. Uh, that might be something, again, uh, you might want to talk to your accountant and see if there's a way uh, to qualify you in this program. Uh, when it comes to the, the, the EIDL uh, disaster loan, I, I think you should look at that a little bit closer. Uh, quite frankly, I've not studied that aspect of this program, um, but I think it's worth you at least looking at to see if you may well qualify for that $10,000 grant. Uh, and again, these are, these are intended for an eight-week period. Um, so this may be something that, uh, you know, if you do qualify for the $10,000, it would be a welcome thing uh, to have to cover that eight-week period as you continue to try and move forward with your business. Great. Well, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, I, again, I want to urge everyone who thinks they may qualify for this benefit uh, to, to make the application. Uh, to, to, to rehire your folks. Let's see what we can do about getting everyone back to work. I know it's a scary time for everyone. Uh, this is the, the exact reason why a federal program like this is created, uh, to create the opportunity for people to rehire people who are not being employed right now. Uh, I know from, from my wife's fitness studio, there are a number of university students who rely on these paychecks going through university and paying off student loans and things like that. And then there's other folks uh, who rely on this for supplemental income. And this is a welcome thing uh, to be able to do this uh, and a thing that as employers we really should be thinking about. So uh, think about it, uh, do your best, um, talk to your banker about this. Um, I wish I had time to talk to everyone about this program. Of course, I'm gonna get back to trying to run my business and run it as best I can uh, during this crazy time. Uh, so I wish you all well, uh, and I look forward to seeing everyone out at a patio bar at some point in the future. Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, take care and stay safe.